we can uh, reconvene our meeting to open session. The board has been in executive session since 6 o'clock to discuss a litigation matter, uh, tenure candidates, um, and a personnel matter. If we could all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We could have introductions. Dave Hurst. Wendy Sampson. Jonathan Fishbone. Willow Bear. Jody Monroe. Holly Dallenbaugh. Christine Beck. Catherine Natto. Meredith Moriarty. And Judy Kehoe. Um, and I'll just uh, welcome, uh, I think we have some pig students with us for the first time in a really, really long time. So nice to see you guys. It made me happy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and just a reminder to all of our visitors that we um, are still requiring masks in the building. Uh, first on the agenda is our approval of minutes. It is recommended that the Board of Education approve the minutes from the September 22nd, 2021 regular board meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. Next are our meeting reports. Uh, first up is our superintendent's report. Thank you. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, testing because we've had uh, several parents when students have to be out because they're symptomatic um, having trouble getting a test and so they wanted some clarification I've received a few emails as to what test are will the district allow um, so we will take obviously a PC a lab based PCR test but there's also a rapid PCR tests that are also allowable uh, which is a quicker way for students to return uh, to school. I know there's still some challenges with getting that, but we d are going to put out, I don't think we put it out yet, communication to families, just letting them know that those two tests are acceptable for return to school. And so hopefully, uh, as long as those rapid uh, PCR tests are available, students shouldn't have to stay out of school, because I know the um, molecular tests sometimes take three to five days at times to get the results, mm -hmm. especially now with schools back in session and more people being tested. So uh, we will share that with families. So I wanted to make sure um, that was out there. Do we know where people can get the, if, they, if their pediatrician doesn't have it, are, can we give any guidance to actually where people can go to get a rapid test? Yeah, so we um, did provide a link. Albany County Department of Health does keep an updated list of the dif different testing sites as well as vaccination centers so we can include that it's usually fairly current and does indicate what type of tests are available uh, but i have heard that people have gone to some locations and they've run out of the test or i've also heard there's been very long waits yeah. for tests i know i had an email from a, a parent who was asking me what kind of tests will accept and i think in their their um her husband waited like five hours to get a test, so it's a little bit crazy right now. So, but we will, we can include that. So. I think that'd be great. Yep. And Jody, just to clarify, the rapid antigen test that you can purchase over the counter. Right. What I'm hearing you say is it's a PCR test only, and those are not being accepted right. for return to school. Correct. Exactly. Not for symptomatic. Those are we use those for asymptomatic screening, but they're not allowed for return to school for symptomatic individual. It has to be the PCR test. Yep. Thank you. Um, also along the lines of some of our mitigation, the district reopening committee. I say that reopening sounds crazy, but from last year did meet a week ago and we went through several areas in our mitigation plan that we wanted to review so uh, some of the areas and we did put uh, this out to the community as well about uh, vaccinations continuing to require students who participate in high-risk activities whether that be music or band or athletics since the, the high-risk activities are getting underway and, and winter sports will start soon. Students who are eligible will be required to be vaccinated 
and um, that information has gone out. The other area we talked about are field trips, and right now, field in the high transmission zones, which we're currently in, we will not do field trips for K through eight, but we will allow them for nine through 12. Uh, for nine through 12, the committee felt like it was reasonable to have check students' vaccination depending on where they're going, and if they're not vaccinated, doing a test to make sure, especially since they're on a bus for generally longer periods of time, that is where there's been some transmissions and also where kids get quarantined. So that would be for 912 and hopefully as things improve, we will um, expand the field trip option for our younger students. And at the high school, I think we're up to at least 87, 88% of the kids are vaccinated. Exactly, right, so it's a very small number who aren't. Um, we did send out the consent forms. Those of you who are parents probably got consent for testing. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are putting in place a testing plan and we're primarily focusing on our unvaccinated students. I know our nurses have been working on that. So we're hoping to begin uh, next week. One of the challenges we're facing is we have the antigen test from last year that we received an email that said they're expiring as of Saturday. We did put in a new order to the state several weeks ago, and we don't have any confirmation as to when we'll receive those tests. So some of it is hoping that we'll get those soon. So um, we did also allow more flexibility in our classroom seating. We're still following the three feet distancing and masking, which is um, we're required to do, uh, but we are allowing teachers to put students in smaller groups facing each other, which uh, the teachers were thrilled about having and the ability to move students around more. We talked about social emotional support for students, and we did discuss indoor facility use while in the high transmission zone and the group. Uh, agreed that we should continue with that restriction while we're in the high transmission zone for now. And we would reassess that when we meet again, probably in a few weeks. Um, and that is my report. Anybody have questions for Jody? All right, next up is our board report. Um, first, I just wanted to make everybody aware and thank you to Wendy. Um, Wendy has agreed to serve as our um, board delegate to uh, NISBA's annual business meeting um, on October 18th. Um, so again, thank you for doing that. Um, and I had the opportunity to attend open houses for both the middle school and the high school. Um, which seemed to go pretty smoothly. So thank you to all the teachers and uh, staff for putting those on. And one thing in particular that caught my eye at the high school open house was I was able to see some of the new furniture um, in the background in some of the classrooms, some of the furniture that we um, had put money in the budget for um, uh, last year yeah. um, to purchase. And, uh, and it looks good. So I thought everybody would be interested to hear that since we can't get in and see it ourselves at the moment. Um, there was a meeting of the District Diversity Committee earlier um, this afternoon. I don't know if somebody who is on, um, on the committee would like mm -hmm. to report out on what happened. Yeah, it was a fantastic meeting. Um, great turnout of uh, parents, school administrators from across the district, um, students all coming together to look at setting goals and identify what it is the committee wants to work through this year. Uh, the goals that were set were incredibly ambitious uh, and it's gonna be a fantastic work to start diving in and figuring out how do we prioritize these. Uh, that's one of the next steps. Everybody's gonna be submitting their um, kind of thoughts on prioritization. And then how do we start uh, moving toward action? So great meeting and um, thanks to Christine, Wendy, uh, Jody, lots of, lots of folks were on there. It was a fantastic meeting. Great. Anything we had not a committee. 
um, a couple weeks ago, but we're going to be talking about it tonight. They'll be presenting, so I don't need to give any details about it because we have awesome. Marvin and company here. Um, that's all I had. I don't know if anybody else has anything that they would like to add or share at this time. Great. Uh, moving on to the next item on our agenda um, is our presentation this evening, and we have our audit summary. <laughs> You're done. Good evening, everybody. Um, tonight, we are going to give a recap of the district's financial statements that were issued for the June 30th, 2021 year end. As Christine noted, we did have our audit committee meeting on September 27th, and that was the opportunity when our auditors, Marvin and Company, um, headed by Heather Lewis, um, had presented their findings to the audit committee. Okay, thank you. Oh, that's better. <laughs> so following our audit committee meeting on the 27th, um, the uh, questions were asked and answered, and um, we are going to have um, Heather Lewis give a quick overview on the audit report. And then following that, I'll give a quick recap of the numbers, how we trended last year to this year, and what some of the highlights are. Um, we have um, completed all of the um, submissions of the ST3 report. That's the financial and statistical data that we're required to submit to the state every year. Um, following um, the recommendation from the Audit Committee for the Board to accept the report this evening, we will submit that in to SED and OSC as well, as is required. And uh, the full report will also be posted on the district's website. So um, at this moment, I'm going to turn it over to Heather Lewis to give her overview of the audit, and then I'll step back in when she's done. Thank you, Judy. OK, so um, as, as Judy mentioned, we've met with the audit committee, went through um, questions and everything in detail. So high-level summary, um, we have our required communication with those charged with governance. Um, that discloses that the accounting policies are disclosing the financial statements. We did implement a new standard, which had a minimal impact on the district. But you know, there are various estimates within your financial statements. We believe the estimates are reasonably stated. We did not have any difficulties in performing our audit. We did not have any disagreements with management, and we also did not have any material in the statements detected as part of the audit process. So that is all really great information. Um, we also audited your extra classroom activity funds, issued an, um, uh, an opinion letting you know that we believe those are fairly stated in accordance with the cash basis of accounting. We also audited the district's financial statements. Uh, management is responsible for making sure those financial statements are fairly presented and in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles, making sure they have good internal controls in place. Our responsibility is to express an opinion and follow various standards. Heather, Our opinion, Heather is that the, would, yeah. would you mind if you just if you speak a little more slowly um, because there's a slight delay, I think, with the audio coming in, and I think it would make it sure. clear for the audience to hear. Thank you. Okay. So our responsibility is to make sure your financial statements are materially correct and in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. Um, we consider your internal controls as part of that process. We do not give an opinion, but we do consider them. And our opinion is that the district's financial statements are fairly stated in all material respects in accordance with generally accepted accounting principles. So that's a clean opinion. It's an unmodified opinion, highest level of assurance that we can provide. We also have to consider the district's compliance with internal controls um, over financial reporting and compliance with laws and regulations. We did not identify any internal control deficiencies. We also did not identify any material non-compliance. So again, those are clean reports. We also have to audit your compliance in accordance with the uniform guidance because you receive federal awards and for that, we also believe you complied in all material respects with the direct and material compliance requirements. So that, again, is a clean opinion. So overall, the audit went very well. Um, we did not identify any internal control deficiencies to report or any material non-compliance. That is everything. 
everything that I have. So I'll go ahead and turn it back over to Judy. Okay, thank you, Heather. So now I'd just like to take a, a few moments and uh, give you a quick recap, on the, starting on the next slide, with what the actual results showed for the district. So to start with, um, if we look at our comparative expenditures from the prior year, 1920, up to 2021, there was only a 1.38% increase in our total expenditures from last year to the following year. And we were also significantly under budget by over $5 million. Um, our budget was about $103 million. And um, as we had talked about during the budget presentations where we were looking at um, variances in the budget, um, we knew that we would need to spend some additional money on instruction and supports in the classroom as we were going through our second year of the pandemic and um, we were able to provide those resources where they were most helpful and then we were able to hold positions open as we needed to um, you'll note that there was actually a decrease in the general support and part of that was reflecting from support positions that we were able to leave unfilled in order to make sure we had enough resources to devote into the instructional program we also had a decrease in our actual expenditures for people transportation, as we've been talking about quite extensively. We have been struggling to find drivers, so the fact that our budget was lower was because we had some unfilled positions, and because of that, we were forced to shrink the number of bus routes that we had for students. Um, the other elements were um, fairly consistent from one year to the next, and again, with only a, a 1.38% increase, that's uh, below the rate of inflation and uh, is a good trend, certainly, in terms of those actual expenditures. To drill down a little bit more deeply on the next slide, we just look at our fringe benefits. There's also another unusual number on there for health insurance to be declining, um, close to 5% reduction. And the reason that happened was 2020 to 21 was the first year where um, a large number of our employees had switched to a new health plan where there were higher deductibles on the costs of less frequently used services, things like urgent care and emergency rooms, and that resulted in premium reductions. So um, next this current year that we're in, the remainder of all of our employees will be moving on to that new form of health plan, and we should hopefully see a relatively steady number on the health insurance numbers again next year, if not a slight decrease. Um, the other um, larger increases related to our um, teachers' retirement system and employees' retirement system pension costs, those rates are set by the state and are simply a percentage of our salaries. The TRS increase was largely driven by the increase in um, instructional salaries um, as we had applied those resources in for COVID. But overall, a 1.61 increase was also fairly nominal. And then, lastly, in the revenues for the general fund. The um, numbers were largely in accordance with budget. We came in with less than a million dollar um, variance on our overall revenues, which is pretty good. It was an increase of only 0.46%. The largest increase from one year to the next, as you would expect, would be in our school taxes, where we had the 2.34% tax levy increase in the 2021 school year and that yielded 1.573 million. And if you're wondering why the school taxes number was even higher, remember, as we have talked about in prior years, as the state is changing how the STAR credit program is working, we actually, new homeowners cannot get that credit on their tax bills. They have to go directly to New York State for the STAR program. So when they go directly to the state, that means we actually collect a higher amount of the tax levy. And um, there's a lower amount. That decrease in the STAR pilots line is because of that shift in how the state is maintaining that program. There was also a noticeable reduction in our interest income. If you've been following interest rates or you're trying to do um, investing um, with your bank accounts, you're noticing that the rates did drop quite a bit over this past year. Um, so that was the largest reason for that um, decrease on the interest numbers. Our state 
and federal aid um, did better than we had expected. Remember that in the prior year, we were expecting a 20% reduction in our state aid, which did not come to pass. The reduction in aid was more so driven by those um, expense reimbursement-based aids, most notably in the transportation. If we spend less in the first year, then we get less money in aid in the following year. But um, overall, it's usual to have pluses and minuses within the various line items, and uh, we did end up um, in a good place. Judy, yeah. what is covered by miscellaneous? Oh, miscellaneous includes um, miscellaneous various charges. Uh, charges for services are mostly in that third line. Um, it's not the insurance reimbursements. I'd have to pull it. It's a list of about probably 40 different codes that are included in there. Um, so individually, very small. Um, but I can uh, put that in board updates for you okay. this week That'd be um, great. as well. Thank you. As a recap for our fund balance and all of our restricted reserves, and we did end the year with an undesignated, um, unappropriated fund balance of just under 3.5 million, which was at 3.4% of the subsequent year's budget. As we've talked about during budget, that number is required to be 4% or less in order to be in compliance with the state requirements. The other notable component for our fund balances, of course, are the $5.1 million in the 2015 capital reserve and the $10 million in the 2019 capital reserve. So as we've talked about as part of the capital project presentations, the reason why we are able to put this project forth to the community at our October 19th um, vote is because of those sizable reserves. So those amounts coupled with the federal aid is what allows us to cover the district's local share of that proposed capital project. So um, probably not the end of next year because we won't be doing construction yet, but the following year is when you'll start to see those balances drawn upon, assuming everything is approved by the community um, on the October vote. So that's a quick recap of the general fund. I wanted to touch on the school lunch fund as well. This is a separate fund apart from the general fund, and it is intended to account for only those activities associated with the lunch program. So normally, when we're able to offer lunches, um, we have um, additional breakfast sales, we have the a la carte services and the snacks. Uh, you can see, if you look to the prior year's number, we had almost $700,000 in those sales. And you can see we had a significant drop down to only $37,000. And that's because we were not able to offer those types of services due to COVID and limiting the supply of those types of foods. So the big increase, though, where that was offset is in the state and federal aid. So you can see where we were at $222,000 last year. We were up to over a million dollars, and that was because of the shift where the government stepped in and provided reimbursements for all meals, and those meals were available to all students. So in total, the revenues were close to the prior year, not prior year numbers from 1.3 last year up to just under 1.3 this year. But the composition of those individual line items was a dramatic shift because of the change in the program. Okay. And on the next slide for our expenditures, we were at about $1.3 million for our total expenditures, which was just slightly um, more than our expenditures. So we had a loss of $25,000. Um, salaries were relatively consistent, as were our fringe benefits. You'll note that there was a big increase in supplies. That also was part of COVID, because everything had to be boxed up separately for students' um, trays. We needed more disposable products for serving. And then um, our food products, again, um, due to the change in the volume of what was being served, the type of food that was being served, um, that number was down slightly as well. So um, the loss was actually, if you go to the next slide, 
the operating loss was about $136,000, which was better than it had been in the prior year. Um, we did need to transfer in $110,000 from the general fund, and while there was a reduction in the overall fund balance in the food service program, um, it's still strong at the $75,000 ending fund balance amount. So if this has left you wanting more financial information, the audit report is about 80 pages long, and that has all of the footnotes and all of the other details um, about the district's finances. Um, the management discussion and analysis covers uh, many of the points that I've covered with you tonight relative to the general fund operations. And um, that is the quick recap. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to take them, or Heather as well. I asked all mine a week and a half ago. <laughs> okay. Did uh, the members of the audit committee have any, did you guys have any comments or discussion or anything that you want to share at this point? Or no, we had no concerns. Everything was given to us in, in detail. And the only, um, there's a couple items that were not material in nature. So okay. no concerns here. So drawing more on your expertise and experience and less on the, the actual numbers here, when you look at how things changed last year, are there any are there any red flags that you see? Are there any things that need to be that we need to be considering going, you know, looking at budgeting going forward based on just changes? Anything that jumps out? I mean, even though we had some volatility in the normal flow of numbers, we knew that was going to be the case, so we were adjusting what we were expending, uh, expending monies on. Um, we really put the brakes on things that were non-essential, so we were able to manage that during the course of the year. We do want to always keep in mind the long-term financial situation, which is the essence of your question. Um, it's really not about one year, it's about what do we need to do to keep things flowing. So we are looking out and projecting on that multiple year basis. And we know that we have the tools to adjust if we have to. Uh, as I like to say with the budget, reality happens. And every year something is going to be different and we need to either typically adjust our expenditures if um, we need to, we'll pull from another department if we have discretion there. So no, there really aren't any red flags. It's just part of what we do is monitoring that activity. And then obviously if there were any concerns, we would flag that for um, Jody and then also for the board so that we could address it in a timely fashion. Um, state aid tends to be um, a wild card for us as well. Uh, the news was very good, certainly as we were going into this budget year. Um, that really, if you read the footnotes to the financial statements, that's where they cite the greatest degree of uncertainty because every year we are somewhat at the mercy of what the legislature will approve and what our ultimate funding will be. But no, we're good with our reserves. Um, we've really taken the long-term view there as well. Um, when we have um, reviews from the credit analysts, every time we're going to market with the bonds, they do cite that we're in a good financial position with both the reserves and most notably with the conservative budgeting. We always get high marks on that. We are pretty accurate with our revenues, so we don't do you know overstatements of what we expect is going to be coming in. And then we always, as our, we are required to do by statute, come in under on the expenditures. So. Finances, um, I always like when finances are boring so that there aren't any exciting things going on for the board under the, uh, the no surprises category. So, well, thank you for a boring report. Uh, and, uh, you're very welcome. Thank you to your entire team because I know that these numbers don't whip themselves into shape. So, uh, okay. they do not. Uh, Phyllis and Martha in my office have spent countless hours pulling this all together and doing those submissions. So, uh, couldn't do it without them. Extend our thanks. Thank you did jog a question for me though. So with the food services, Catherine, the goal is to like break even every year. So my question for you this year is, how is it looking because of we're getting additional aid, or we got additional aid. How does it look this year for us food service wise? Are we going to be more, we're going to be more than that 75,000. I would assume that we're going to be dipping in more. But um, with the price escalations that we're seeing on the food that's coming into us, yes, I would expect that we would not be making a profit with the food service unless the federal government, they have been providing additional aid if they realize that those reimbursements could be buffered 
somewhat. Um, maybe that would help offset it, but I haven't heard of anything in the works on that, so at this point I would expect a loss. Whenever there's a loss in the food service fund, that becomes a transfer from the general funds because we must support those program operations. But if you look at the amounts that we've had to transfer in there, um, for a $103 million budget, it's relatively insignificant in the grand scheme of things. So it's very important to food service, but it's a very small impact on the general fund. So if, so if anybody were to want to take further action on this, one could contemplate maybe reaching out to their federally elected officials about uh, the need for, for school funding. Mm -hmm. Always so appreciate some advocacy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, well, no further questions then, thank you. Thank you, Heather, to you and your audit team this year. Everything went very smoothly, and um, thank you. Thanks, Heather, and thanks, Judy. Uh, next on the agenda is our recognition of public comment on an agenda item. If we have any visitors who would like to address the board on an agenda item, now is the time to come forward. Is there a question? Oh, do you have a question? Um, if you would like to speak on an agenda item, now is the time. If it's on a non-agenda item, we have time later. Okay. <laughs> uh, next, item six, uh, action items. A, finance action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following finance action items one through three. Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. B, professional personnel action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following professional personnel action items one through seven. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. C, support personnel action items. It is recommended that the, by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following support staff action items 1 through 13. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. D, other action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following action items one through six. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? That passes. Item seven, uh, recognition of public comment on a non-agenda item. If we have any visitors who would like to address the board on a non-agenda item, please come up to the microphone and state your name. Hi, good evening. My name is Lindsay. Um, I am here tonight to give a voice to my children and all children that are affected by the mask and vaccine mandates. I would also like to present evidence that proves masks and the shot that is being promoted as a vaccine is illegal, unconstitutional, and unethical. In doing so, I urge the superintendent and school board to open their hearts and to see a different viewpoint other than the media's constant misinformation. Our children that we lend to you eight hours of the day suffers significantly at the hands of the administration that no longer have an interest in protecting them. Our children were sent home from school to get over the curve. It has not taken two weeks to get over the curve but a year and a half and is still going on. They have done everything that you have asked, from wearing a mask, social distancing, eating lunch in their classrooms, missing out on extracurricular activities, and I could go on. 
We know now that the effects of wearing masks causes hyperventilation, restricts oxygen intake, and causes excessive carbon dioxide retention. The symptoms that we are seeing in our children are anxiety, shortness of breath, headaches, dizziness or confusion, numbness or tingling in their hands and feet. And we are still making our children wear masks eight hours of the day. A COVID micron is 40,000 times smaller than a cross section of a hair. Masks do not stop a virus. The CDC lists the mortality rate of K through 12 to be 0 0.0003. With this information, it should be difficult to justify mandating masks. The vaccines are granted use based upon reducing symptoms only, not based on preventing transmission. Many fully vaccinated people have already experienced COVID again. Once the trials are completed, Moderna, October 27, 2022, and Pfizer, January 31st, 2023, the data will then be analyzed. Only at that time can an informed consent be obtained for a person to receive the vaccine. We all agree this is the way to receive a new medication and the difference from being mandated to receive that medication. We know that our children will carry the trauma of these unethical, illegal, and unconstitutional mandates for many years. The scary part is that we don't know what the severity range of issues will be, but we do know that will happen because we are seeing the effects already. I am looking at the science, which is the way to prove a solution. Children should not be used as pawns in this scheme. What works for my children and my family may not work for yours or somebody else. And that is where individuality needs to come into play. My children, my choice. It is plain and simple as that. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. Uh, seeing no other visitors, uh, moving on to item eight, future meetings and events. Um, on Tuesday, October 19th, uh, here at the high school in Gym A from 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., we have the vote, uh, the community vote on the capital project. Um, and then on Wednesday, October 20th, um, that's our next regular board meeting, anticipating an executive session at 6 and reconvening to an open meeting at 7. Do we have signs for the capital project vote the way we do for budget votes or any other way that we, I mean, I know emails went out, but is that, do we advertise that to remind people to vote in any other way? Do we have way? any signs for the bond votes in the past? I believe that there are some signs. I'll follow up with O&M tomorrow. They usually are the ones who will put those yeah, signs out. I know we have some banners, so I'll probably usually put them up like maybe a week before. Yeah, at the elementary and each yeah. school building. So. Yeah, that's a good point. I think if we have them, that would be helpful. Uh, seeing no need to go back into executive session, um, could I get a motion to adjourn the meeting? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Good night, everybody. <laughs>